on the outside of this part we'd have to go and get all of the machine marks out so we would take this certain process in machining make sure that everything was rigid and we would come back and we would just kiss it perfectly and although we use scotch sprite on a lot of different parts on these we use sandpaper very fine sandpaper and put some oil on there and, and just just gave it this really good finish so we could keep it shiny and then it would go to the platers now the platers first thing they do once they rack your parts and they get ready to actually anodize them they etch them and in this particular case etching should just be like super quick it's an acid bath they drop your parts in there they etch them they give it kind of tap right so the anodize can actually stick to the part but in our case they actually left it in for too long it took off too much material usually it takes off maybe a tenth of material but it took off too much material it dulled the finish and therefore when we anodized the part it was a type 2 anodized which comes out nice and shiny it actually came out more like a hard anodized part which is like a type 3 which is much duller now when I got these parts back I was devastated because they looked uh, after all of the work I knew that we had a problem I had fought for that job so much and for months and months probably a couple years I was trying to get the part but they didn't trust me because I wasn't big enough yet they had finally given me the job and now here I have parts on this cosmetic surface these parts are not to spec it's not what they called out it's not what's on the notes and now I have to go talk to their inspector the inspector looks at the parts and says this is absolutely a no-go how would you fix this of course we can strip the parts but that makes it even more dull then we can go polish it and yet all of these tolerances are crazy so on this job I not only lost a ton of money because I couldn't deliver my parts I didn't get money from the anodizer and my customer that I had fought so hard to get almost canceled our contract we ended up working day and night delivering smaller batches of parts and fixing that whole job and we got all the parts done we changed platers and all of it we just lost credibility during that order and it took a long time to get that credibility back the reason that I'm telling you guys this story is because I've experienced crazy things and this is one of those parts of manufacturing that gets overlooked this is one of those things that people don't really talk about it's not really exciting and not a lot of people have the experience the people that have experiences with it they don't they're not on YouTube they're not talking about it and I want you guys to understand that there's so many variables in CNC machining and we have to think about all of them now we're looking at platers and anodizing and we think like oh it's just a plated surface what could go wrong but through experience I've learned so many different things and I've seen so many different things and I want to make sure that you guys are not reinventing the wheel and you can have your eyes open going in so when you're looking at anodizing you can have masking failures you can have plugs dislodging from threads discoloration when they take a part and drop it into an anodized tank they have to move them around to get the air pockets out they have to there's a certain process that they have to go by and if they don't it can discolor your parts it can create bubbles it can create corners that doesn't have proper anodized I've seen platers like with just crazy lead times or they give you a lead time and they don't keep it and it ends up being an extra week we got our legs back for our table you know the crazy table that we just machined and one of the legs had massive damage to it luckily we had an extra leg but it was simply that the forklift driver when he went to pick up the pallet with all the boxes the forklift driver actually came in to pick up the pallet but the fork went through the box hit our part like one of the legs for our table and damaged it beyond use now we had an extra part but that's lucky that we had an extra part because during this process right here he just failed and damaged the part and I don't want to go make another part set up the entire job again for one piece have to go plate again so you got to make sure that your eyes are open and that when in, there's critical parts 
that you let them know these are critical parts and you have a relationship with them in a way that there's just crazy communication and you follow it right through the entire process. Those big boxes, even if it isn't cosmetic, even if it isn't like crazy, write on the boxes and say cosmetic parts. Do not drop, do not double stack, do whatever you can to protect your parts, your boxes. When they're boxing the parts up to ship them back, they should have a process on how to box them. How do you want the parts packaged and boxed to be delivered back to you? You might pay a little bit extra, but it's better than getting scrap parts. Just like our customers audit us and they want to make sure that we have the proper tools, machines, and documentation. We have to audit our vendors, our platers. We have to make sure that we look at their documents, their process documents, and make sure that we understand the entire process. You can make the greatest parts in the world. You can put out perfect quality, but if you don't understand plating and you don't have a great plater as a vendor, you can scrap everything, you can lose everything, and it can be a huge problem. Some of the things that we would talk about is just understanding the different types of anodized. Etching the part, that's an acid etch that you do that prepares the material to get anodized. There's chem film, or alodyne as it's called, and that's a very light finish, like just, just a few tents that basically goes and protects the material. A lot of times they'll alodyne threads that are going to get masked and then they'll anodize the rest of the parts and that's added protection. You got different types. The types most commonly used would be type 2 anodized. When you look at type 2, there is a tolerance on that surface that it actually builds up and it's about two tenths up to about a thou and two tenths. A lot of people will look at it and they'll think, oh, it's adding, let's say, five tenths onto the part surface. So if we have two inches of material, it'll add five tenths to one side. Now, of course, if you have two sides, it's five tenths on one side and it's five tenths on the other side. But cool things to know and what you should know is that five tenths often means two and a half tenths, meaning two and a half tenths that you can measure because two and a half tenths went into your material. So it's in the material and out of the material. And therefore, it's very important if you're getting into anodizing your parts that you get educated on this. When you look at type three per surface, the thickness will be five tenths up to maybe three thousandths. Now, again, you have a certain amount that's inside the material and a certain amount that's outside the material. When you're looking at threads, threads is very, very difficult to understand because now you're putting a surface on a thread which is at an angle and each of the threads basically has two surfaces and therefore you have on one side of the diameter you have two surfaces that are getting plated at this angle and then on the other side of the diameter you have two surfaces that are getting plated. You have to make sure that you account for all of those. Now, how do you account for them? If you're tapping or threading, you use an oversized tap, or you take your thread mill and you go up based on the type of anodize that you use. So if we know the thickness of our type two or the thickness of our type three, we'd make the thread larger based on those tolerances. When, if you look at a regular tap, there's G values and H values. G designates a ground thread. H designates the pitch diameter. You can get these taps and they'll be like H3. And H3, you might just use for a standard thread that doesn't get anodized or it's getting plugged. But if you're actually putting anodized based on the tolerance, You'll go up to an H7, which will be a larger tap. It'll add three thousandths to three and a half thousandths to the diameter that's being cut. Therefore, when you anodize the inside of that thread, it comes back down closer to what it would be for like an H3. 
and you can go up to an H11. There's all these different sizes. So I implore you, be a student of the game and educate yourself. Make sure that you interview your players and make sure they give you the right information and, and call them out. What is the surface finish? What is the buildup? What size should I make this hole? If you're anodizing threads, we need to understand that anode will go in a certain way, but then it'll kind of dissipate into nothing. So it won't just coat perfectly through the entire diameter deep into a hole. It'll only go to a certain place. A lot of times, many companies say, hey, we can't have any anodized in the threaded holes, and therefore they'll use plugs. But guess what? Plugs come out. And you know, I, got, I got a crazy story on, on, on these. So I used to have all of these parts that we used to do. And we, we literally had like a hundred of these like M3 holes and, and 832 holes and just these tiny holes. And there was black anodized on the entire part. And when we would go in and grab all the parts, we would have a bunch of holes that got anodized because the person putting the plugs in, literally it's somebody sitting down putting plugs into those threads, they wouldn't put them in correctly and the plugs would actually come out during the process and therefore I had some holes that were perfect and some holes that were not perfect. Shaney works for me and, and other people work for me and they can tell you there was a lot of times where we were sitting around tables and we were chasing threads to get the anodize out of the parts and a lot of times the parts were scrapped because of it. So in this one part that we were doing where this kept happening, I kept going and complaining and talking to the plater and they kept telling us this is the process, this is what we're doing and this is just part of the game like the plugs are going to come out and at that time I didn't have a lot of experience so what did I do I actually looked at it and I said okay I have to deliver a hundred parts but because 15 percent are going to get scrapped based on these plugs dislodging I'm going to actually make 20 percent more parts I'm going to and I'm going to charge the customer for producing the time to produce 120 of them, right? An extra 20%. I'm going to charge them for everything. And then, if I, because that's time I have to put in on this job. And then if I lose a certain amount, I'm still getting paid for my time. So we put it into the deal. Now, guess what? A year goes by, we do a million parts. Not a million, but a lot. And we lose a ton of parts. One day... I get sick of it and I actually go and I find another plater and guess what? No plugs come out. So the cost I was giving my customer ended up being an inflated cost. I thought that that was just what it was and what it needed to be. And then later I experienced that not all platers are equal and this other plater just had better employees with a better technique and and maybe better plugs who knows but they killed it every single time and I was able to lower the part price to my customer and basically told them the whole story and they appreciated that because your customer is a partner with you and when you can drop that price they they appreciate it and your vendor your plater is a partner you guys are family they're feeding their families because of the work that you're giving them. Now, to end this, I just want to say that if you have a great plater and that plater is taking care of you and not scrapping your parts, make sure you take care of them. Make sure you pay early when you can. Make sure that you're giving them the best parts. Make sure you have great communication and make sure that like when Christmas happens or whatever, Make sure that you actually go and give them those flowers or donuts or, or whatever it is because you have a great relationship and it's good to show your vendors that you care.